Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 324th episode, we have a bunch of news, including three new sauropods. Mm-hmm. I was going to do four, but these three are pretty intense and very interesting. I'll take it. We also have dinosaur of the day, Velifrons, which is a Lambiosaurine hadrosaurid. And we have our fun fact. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep the podcast running. Up first, we have a brand new patron named Jim Metrodon. I'm really tempted to pronounce it Jai Metrodon because it's spelled like Dimetrodon mm. with a J. But I very much doubt that their name is Jime. <laughs> Probably Jim. I like Jim Metrodon. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And also, I want to thank Florida Fossil Hunter, who is not a new patron. They've been a patron for quite a while, but I just haven't thanked them before. It's also a good name. Rolls off the tongue. Yeah, it is. Some nice alliteration there. And you know where they're fossil hunting. Exactly. And rounding out our shoutouts are Cameron, Rhinosaurus, Christine, Trent Carbajal, Michael, Bradley, Deplato Kate, and Leah. And real quick, I just want to mention something about our survey. The biggest request by far was that we be more conversational, and we are trying. <laughs> mm-hmm. We try to make some changes in the beginning of the year, but it's difficult because we also want to be really accurate, which means we want to follow some notes so we don't misspeak and overgeneralize things or give the wrong impression about something. But yeah, we're trying to be more conversational to make the show a little more interesting to listen to. And we also have a new goal. When we reach 200 patrons, we're going to do a live Q&A on YouTube, which was also one of our top requests on our survey. And given that we're at about 180 now, we're only about 20 away. So you can help us get there by joining our Patreon. So close. Yes. Hopefully we'll get there within a month or two. And when we do get there, we're going to start with our patron questions to make sure that we don't miss any. So if you join our Patreon, you'll get priority q and position for our YouTube session. So definitely consider supporting us on Patreon if you can and if you like our show. Yeah. And again, thank you to those who already do. So if you want to get in on this Q&A, then go to our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So jumping into our three new sauropods, uh, first we have a new species from an existing genus of sauropod, Omasaurus. Oh, that's a good one. It is a pretty cool one. It's mm-hmm. a Mementosaurid. They're all good. They're all sauropods today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. And I should also mention this article is written by Chow Tan and others and published in Historical Biology, which unfortunately is paywalled. But Mementosaurid. Yeah, so that makes it a little better. Omasaurus was Sabrina's Dinosaur of the Day in episode 125. Nice. But since that was 199 episodes ago. Several years at this point. (laughs) Yeah. Which, even though dinosaurs were around for millions of years, we seem to be going at lightning speed and discovering new ones and learning about them. Yeah, I think at the time you said that there were six known species of Omasaurus, but I think there were actually seven. There was one that had been discovered a couple years before that. And then adding this one, now we're up to eight species in a single genus, which is a lot. For a single genus, a lot of times dinosaurs just have one species per genus. Yeah. So eight is pretty crazy. It might be the most. I'm not sure. It's kind of hard to check that. Mm, it, there's been so many changes, and especially the genera that were wastebasket taxons for a while. That's true, yeah. It, you'd have to go through and see how many people agree that things are dubious or not. And it, it's kind of hard to nail down which one has the most. But this is definitely, I would say, in the top 10 of most specious dinosaur genera. Could be, could be. Or at least maybe top 50. I should be more conservative with my <laughs> estimate there. Is it since I haven't looked into it. Could be a top 10 for a Mementosaurid. It might be, yeah. It's probably <laughs> top two for Mementosaurid. But you see, I was being conservative. Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> so a real quick background on Omasaurus since it was like four years ago when it was a dinosaur of the day. The genus Omasaurus was named back in 1939. And the type species is Omasaurus Jungxianensis, and that's after Jungxian City, which is in the Shashimiao Formation. It's coming up a lot. It's a very fossiliferous locality. Hmm. The Shashimiao Formation might be the closest thing that China has to the Morrison Formation. Sort of the best way I can analogize it for 
<laughs> fossiliferous <laughs> analogize all right <laughs> is it analogize i don't know how to pronounce that but the shashimi formation just like the morrison formation is full of sauropods and lots of other dinosaurs it is about 10 million years before the Morrison. It's in the late middle Jurassic, but again, the timing of it is a little bit less clear than the Morrison Formation. And it has a lot of Mementosaurids in it, including several species of Omasaurus. This new species is Omasaurus pushiani. Again, the Omasaurus comes from the existing genus. Ome is after Mount Ome. So mm. maybe it should be Omasaurus, but they spell it with an O. An amazing source. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ome. I didn't even notice that that's kind of like Ome. Like amazing. So Mount Ome is near where Omeosaurus was found. And Mount Ome is one of the four sacred Buddhist mountains of China. Mm. It's also called the Place of Enlightenment. And at least that's what it is if you translate the Mandarin directly to English. This new species, Pushanai is a reference to a Buddhist deity. The Samantabhadra in Chinese is Pushian. And just to fully explain, the Samantabhadra is a local bodhisattva. And Merriam-Webster defines a bodhisattva as a being that compassionately refrains from entering nirvana in order to save others and is worshipped as a deity. Hmm. So Omasaurus is named after the mountain it was found in, which is a sacred place for Buddhists. And then Pushanai is in reference to a specific Buddhist deity. Cool. Yeah, it's all kind of linked to where it was from. So it's a clever way to make a place name Saurus, place name Ensis, mm -hmm. without it literally just being the place names in both of them. The holotype of Omasaurus Pushanai is mostly articulated. Nice. And it's a it's a pretty good holotype. It has several very long neck vertebrae series. I would expect it being a mementia sword. <laughs> yeah. The longest neck vertebrae is 71 centimeters or two feet, four inches long. Wow. That's a single vertebrae. It's like the length of my torso. That's amazing. It's just one. It's all my vertebrae are like You're just one part vertebrae. of one big neck. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Or at least my vertebrae are. I'm taller than two foot four inches. Right. You would be roughly three vertebrae? Yeah, about. I mean, this is the longest vertebrae. Some of them are a little bit smaller. But yeah, about three vertebrae is about how big I am. Just as a, a bonus fun fact aside, that two foot four inches is over twice as long as a giraffe's extremely long vertebrae. And giraffes and humans have the same number of neck vertebrae, seven, whereas Omasaurus had 17. <laughs> so you take a giraffe's neck, you make the vertebrae twice as long, and then you like double and a half the number of vertebrae. That gives you <laughs> Omasaurus Pushyanai's neck. Just makes me think of that exhibit we saw, the time travel that felt kind of like a ride in Japan. That room where it was like a, a time travel experience at the Kitak Yushu Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they've got a Mementosaurus, and it's amazing how they can, it's animatronic and it can move its neck. Yeah, it's the animatronic is mostly neck because it's sort of off to the side, but the neck is so long that you can't even tell that the body is mostly just drawn on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine what it was like for that these sorts of dinosaurs to be moving their necks. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So in addition to those neck vertebrae, they also found an almost complete series of back vertebrae and three large segments of tail vertebrae for a total of 46 vertebrae in the find. Hmm. And just roughly, I think that's out of about 70. So we're talking about roughly two thirds of the vertebrae of this individual. It's pretty good. Yeah, especially, the you know, like all sauropods, the tail ends in little tiny vertebrae, so they're missing some of those. But they have a decent chunk, even from pretty close to the tip of the tail. So we've got a, a good series of vertebrae from a lot of the animal. And vertebrae and sauropods are really useful for naming species. In addition to the vertebrae, though, they also found a mostly complete front left leg and foot. The foot is also mostly complete. Mm. A little bit of the hips, some ribs a partial ilium, which again is the top hip bone in both dinosaurs and us, two partial femurs, 
and a partial tibia and extremely partial fibula. The fibula looks like just a tiny little spur on the side of the tibia because it's so small. In other words, what they're missing is the skull, the first few neck vertebrae, most of the hind legs, and most of the hips and a little bit of the sacrum. That's too bad about the skull, but they've got a lot of the skeleton. They do, yeah. The humerus and femur are pictured with a lot of plaster reconstruction on the overall shape, so it's a little bit hard to tell what the bone by itself is. I have no idea why. They just reference in the paper the humerus has a bunch of plaster on it, Hmm. and there's nothing about like where they got it, why it's like that. I kind of assume that this got put up in a display, and then someone realized, wait a second, this isn't just a known Omasaurus species, and then wanted to describe it and you know, looked more closely at it, but I'm not sure. I couldn't actually verify that anywhere. Mm. Fortunately, it has quite a few unique features. It doesn't seem like they're obscured by the plaster. The ratio of ulna to humerus length is about 0.7, which is relatively high. In other words, the lower front leg is relatively long compared to the upper front leg. So the humerus, a lot of times, is most of the leg or at least a large portion of the leg. But in this case, it's less the case. It's a little more even. Mm -hmm. It's probably the easiest unique feature you could see while it's alive because most of the other things are sort of buried in details of the bones that would be covered by flesh. But you might be able to notice this difference in the leg if you could probably measure it at least. (laughs) Good luck measuring. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. You tranquilize it with 10x the elephant dose and maybe you could. Mm. Hopefully it doesn't get injured. One other feature you maybe could see, I don't know, maybe it affects the flexibility of the neck or something, is that the neck vertebrae extend farther towards the base of the neck than on other Omasaurus species. So you can see it when it's a skeleton. I don't know if you could see it while it was alive or if it affected the way it moved or anything, but that's the main other difference. The vertebrae look very similar to a single vertebrae, which was assigned to Omasaurus when it was described in 2018. And the authors retroactively basically assigned that one to Omasaurus Pusiani because it's like, whoa, we found this whole skeleton and that one vertebrae you found matches with it nicely. So we'll include that one. And phylogenetically, in case you're wondering and you're a huge Omasaurus fan, its closest relative is Omasaurus Tienfuensis. Is that because they lived the closest together? I think most of these lived closely in time, but that's just when you do the phylogeny, looking at all the details of the vertebrae and different bones, it's the most similar to that Mm. Omasaurus. So I think it's a pretty cool find. Mm Mm-hmm. I like Menchisaurids. Yeah, they are really awesome. I think they're my favorite sauropod type. Maybe after the saltosaurs with the armor, because, you know, basically like ankylosaurs. Keeping the new sauropod train rolling... Got another one from Historical Biology. This one was written by Veronica Diaz-Diaz and others. And it's named Gariga Titan. And I should point out, Gariga Titan is only three letters away from Garrett Titan. (laughs) (laughs) It's the only dinosaur that starts with G-A-R-R. Yeah. Just like my name. It's pretty cool. Does that make it a favorite? I, I like it. It's a cool one. The name Gariga Titan... Just like the name Garrett doesn't have a great meaning. It means like a small attic. It's not great. Gariga Titan also is not super exciting. Garig is a type of drought-tolerant shrubland, which is common in the Mediterranean. And it's pronounced Garig in French or Gariga in Occitan. By the way, Occitan is a, a Romance language from southern France, which is what they specifically say Gariga Titan the name is based on, but you're not going to find much on what Gariga means in Occitan because it's not a very widely spoken language. Mm -hmm. But if you translate directly from Occitan, it translates as dry thicket. Hmm. So it's the dry thicket titanosaur. (laughs) Is that because of where it was found? Yeah. So that drought tolerant shrubland is really common where it was found. And so they named it after the type of environment that it's in nowadays. Basically, if Gariga Titan was found in California, it would be called Chaparral Titan (laughs) because Chaparral is just basically the English or Spanish, maybe, word for Garig. It's the same sort of small, drought-tolerant brush that mostly turns brown (laughs) in the summer. 
it's it's not the most exciting landscape around, but us Californians are very familiar with it. The full name is Gariga Titan Meridionalis, and Meridionalis is a Latin word for southern. So it's from southern France. They named it southern, and then they named it after the Garig because it was found in a dry area. So another creative place name, <laughs> place name. Yeah, pretty much. It was found in Aix-en-Provence, specifically the Aix-en-Provence Basin, which is, as best I can describe it, in or near the French Riviera. The French Riviera doesn't have well-defined boundaries. This might be a little bit too far from the Mediterranean to technically count, but it's in that area in southeastern France. The area in question has more titanosaur bones than anything else. Ooh. It's mostly dinosaur bones, and then of the dinosaurs, it's mostly sauropods, and then that's pretty much all titanosaurs. So lots of titanosaurs from the area. The area includes the titanosaur Acingonosaurus, which was actually found in the same dig site. So obviously right up front, you should be wondering, is Gariga Titan just Acingonosaurus because they're found in the exact same place? And the two titanosaurs do have a lot in common, but there are some differences. For example, in the neural spines of the neck vertebrae, they have different shapes. There's also like a neural canal is larger in one than the other. Hmm. Little details like that. Again, the vertebrae and sauropods are very useful for naming new species. Jumping ahead a little bit, phylogenetically, Gariga titan didn't come out as a sister taxa to a Cingonosaurus, which is really maybe the best evidence you can have for them not being the same dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Because if they have so much in common that they come out right next to each other on the family tree, that's when things can get lumped easiest. But in this case, the phylogeny put a Cingonosaurus as sort of a first cousin to Gariga titan, whereas Ampelosaurus actually came out as a sister taxa to Gariga titan. Gariga titan was excavated from 2009 to 2012, but unfortunately, unlike the last dinosaur, it was totally disarticulated. Mm. So we don't have that nice pretty view of how the bones all aligned. And it's also less complete. The holotype includes the sacrum and the partial left ilium. That's much less complete. Yeah, so that was all they picked for the holotype, I think because it had the most unique features. And also, since it's the sacrum, it's several vertebrae fused together, and it was kind of in a little bit of a block, so they could know that it was all definitely... One individual. Yeah, I shouldn't say definitely, but most likely. It'd be weird if a bone washed in and it, into an exact lifelike pose next to another vertebrae from a different individual. But they did refer some other bones, which they think were also from Gariga titan. That included another left ilium, a neck vertebra, two humeri, and the right ischium. But then they also tentatively referred some other bones, including a cervical rib, which is a thin neck bone, the right humerus, right ulna, and left femur. So if you add all of those together, it's pretty complete. But you might not want to include the tentatively referred ones. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But... There's a reason they called it tentatively referred. <laughs> because they're not that certain. Yeah, it's they're weird. It actually confused me so much I had to reread this article a couple times so that I could figure out what even was going on because it, it caused some strange size estimate things. But real quick, in case you didn't notice, again, no skull or teeth were found with this one. And for completeness, it's from the late Campanian of about 75 million years ago. So much, much more recent than the last sauropod. They describe Gariga Titan as small to medium-sized. The bone from the smallest specimen appears to have come from an individual that was about 4.4 meters or 14 feet long. Hmm. Again, this is a titanosaur. It's 14 feet long. It's a small one. <laughs> it's a little bit unusual. Yeah, it's very small. It's that oxymoron, the small titanosaur. Yeah, exactly. The largest one, though, was 5.3 meters or 17 feet long. So a little bigger. <laughs> yeah. And the weight estimates, I think, were like 1.9 to two and a half tons. Mm. I guess it's heavier than you get for a theropod of that length, but still pretty small. They describe them all as sub-adult, but there's a slash in between sub and adult, which isn't something I remember seeing before. And they found EFSs in all of them. Again, an EFS is the external fundamental system, which shows that the bone is growing really slowly. And they also did 
an analysis to see what stage of growth the bones were in based on what the osteons looked like. And they were all in the last stages of development. So they don't get much bigger. No, they don't. And elsewhere, they refer to it as skeletally mature. So I don't know why they included the sub, because I think everywhere else would usually call this just adult. If it's skeletally mature, usually call it an adult. Does this have to do with the tentatively referred fossils? I think so. I, and maybe what they're saying is it has an EFS, but the bones haven't fully changed into their final, most compact and like developed state. So even if they're 95 or even 100% of their final size, their bones haven't fully more or less rearranged into their final state. And therefore, you could maybe say it's not completely an adult. But so many dinosaurs die young that on the scale of dinosaurs, I would probably consider these to be adults. It's not like these individuals were going to grow another meter or two. They're pretty much at their maximum size. And that other dinosaur that was found in the exact same area, a Singanosaurus, was around the same size or a little bit bigger. They refute an earlier larger estimate of 8 to 12 meters or 26 to 39 feet and say that it was probably more like 5 to 9 meters or 16 to 30 feet. So there's a little bit of overlap there in size. Was this an island back then? Yeah, I think all of Europe was kind of islandy, but I don't know if there was island dwarfism happening here or not. To figure out the rough maturity of the dinosaurs, they did histology on two right humeri, a left humerus and a femur. So based on the fact that there are two right humeri, you know, there's at least two different individuals there. Mm -hmm. And all the bones looked like they were similar in age. They didn't see any growth series here. They all looked relatively the same. I think they were between 12 and 14 on the ontogenetic scale that's been talked about for sauropods before because they don't always have lags. So you can look at basically the structure of the bone instead mm -hmm. and quantify it that way. And the original paper only went up to 13. 13 was like pretty much adult and these are all 12 to 14. So they're pretty much fully grown, which is pretty useful because it gives you better redundancy you're not just looking at individual variation. Now you have two humeri to base it on, which is one of the good bones to base your species description on. And we can look for common features between the two and name it based on that rather than maybe something odd about an individual. Mm -hmm. Now, the really confusing part, though, they talk about another maximum adult size in the paper. And they say that it could have grown up to 12 to 16 meters or 39 to 52 feet long. It's quite a bit larger. Yeah, it's really confusing because we're talking about these adult bones that are from specimens that max out at 5.3 meters or 17 feet long. Where is the 52 foot long <laughs> bone coming from? And it comes from those bones that are tentatively referred. But could actually be some other genus. Yeah, exactly. So they based it on the largest humerus and the largest ulna, and they came up with this really large size. But they did say, to your point, this could mean that several taxa are present in the material here referred to Garigatitan. Or they have a lot of variability among individuals. Yeah, there are some dinosaurs that have a lot of variability. The authors came up with two possible ways there could be the variability. They said it could be sexual dimorphism, like maybe one of them's a male or a female and that one's way bigger. Right, but that's so hard to figure out. It's quite the claim, <laughs> given that we haven't seen that with any other dinosaur ever proven. And this is a pretty sparse find. I don't really think they have enough evidence to back that up. Another possibility they throw out there is that it could be pathology affecting the growth, maybe making one of them grow extra big or the other one stay small. You know, maybe they were malnourished or who knows what was going on that caused them to be different sizes mm -hmm. or just individual variation. There are humans that are twice as tall as other humans. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are dinosaurs that are twice as long as other dinosaurs. But something weird is going on here. It's it's not just a normal, all of these are from the same <laughs> genus sort of find that I'm used to. But fortunately, the bottom line is, the late Cretaceous of Europe seemed to have quite a variety of small titanosaurs. Yay! Which is cool. I, re I really like the small titanosaurs. Me too. It further confirms that if I could have a pet dinosaur today, it would probably be a dwarf sauropod. I'd be afraid of an ankylosaur, <laughs> that it would get startled by me and break my legs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or your whole body. Yeah. 
And even like notosaurs, they're just bumpy. I don't know how nice they would be to pet. Yeah. I feel you like want a, a sauropod. friendly sauropod. Yeah, I think they could be all right. They'd be relatively easy to feed too, I think, if you had enough land. They would eat a lot. That's for sure. But that's why you get the dwarf version. Mm. It's like the suburban dinosaur pet as opposed to like the full-on farm ranch. I think pet. any titanosaur, dwarf or not, needs a farm or a ranch amount needs, of space. It needs more land than we have. But I think you might be able to get away with a few acres mm. if it was covered in trees for just one sauropod. There's no way to know. Yeah, it's true. But the, people have done some estimates on how much dinosaurs would need to eat, but you're right. Rounding out our three new sauropods, we've got an article written by Rafael Royo Torres and others and published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And this one is open access. Mm. So it's last, but very much not least. They never are. <laughs> sauropods are never least. <laughs> I think every time you've got a bunch of dinosaur news, you always say last, but not least. Oh. I think it's because we like all dinosaur news. That is true. We do. Especially you and your love of sauropods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this last dinosaur is named Nerindosaurus tevanani, but the paper isn't really <laughs> about Nerindosaurus. I feel kind of bad for Nerindosaurus. Oh, what's it about? So the authors said, quote, we visited every institution with identified or purported turiosaurs in Spain, Portugal, France, the UK, Germany, the USA, and Argentina. Okay. Well, which is crazy. I mean, there's so many museums. Yeah. In so it, many places. It's kind of like when Emmanuel Schopp did his sauropod study in 2015. True. This is also a sauropod study. Yeah. I don't realize he went to like four different continents. I thought he did. And if he didn't go there, he at least saw pictures. Hmm. Yeah, it was very thorough. But really, it seems like what they were trying to do was nail down turiosaurs. It's a group that was originally proposed in, I think, 2006, sort of an outgroup of early mid-Jurassic dinosaurs, sauropods, that don't fit within eusauropoda, which are the ones that everybody knows, you know, the big four-legged, long-necked everything's <laughs> titanosaurs are all eusauropods so is brachiosaurus it's like pretty much eusauropod literally means true sauropods so they're the sauropods most people think of when you say sauropod all those sauropods i just mentioned are also in neosauropoda within eusauropoda but this one is a non-neosauropod eusauropod so the eusauropods first started i think in the very beginning of the middle jurassic maybe there was a little bit in the end of the early Jurassic, so talking about like 180 million years ago-ish. And then within 10 to 20 million years, the neosauropods had totally taken over uh, as a subgroup of eusauropods. So these are eusauropods, but not neosauropods. Hmm. So they're sort of like an outgroup of what became all the sauropods we know and love. Hmm. And a really weird group. And that's why it took until 2006 to name them, because they're in this sort of strange position, and we now call them turiosaurs. So the authors were trying to figure out what is going on with these turiosaurs, because no one had really done a complete analysis of them, and a few more had been found since they were named. And just to further emphasize how little the paper is about Narindosaurus, the name Narindosaurus as a dinosaur genus isn't mentioned the most in the paper. Hmm. It's the third most. <laughs> All right. After Loceosaurus, that's the most, then Turiosaurus, and then Narindosaurus. There's more time spent comparing Loceosaurus to Turiosaurus than the <laughs> new dinosaur that was named in the paper. There's a lot of papers, though, that accomplish multiple things. Yes. It's just kind of funny because I'm used to papers where it names a new genus and it's like, this is how important this new dinosaur is. And it's almost like a footnote. Like, oh, yeah, we, look, we, we noticed there's also this new dinosaur. Again, to bring back... Emmanuel Schopp, in his 2015 paper, he didn't set out to bring Brontosaurus back, <laughs> but he did. <laughs> yeah, that was also just kind of a footnote. So, Narindosaurus was actually discovered back in 1906 in, I hope I don't butcher this, but Ankingana Valaka in northern Madagascar. I almost certainly got that wrong, but mm -hmm. that's basically how it's spelled, at least. And as a fun fact from the CIA World Factbook, Madagascar is about four times the size of the state of Georgia in the U.S. 
Wow. It's also about two and a half times the size of Great Britain. Not all of the only the first thing is from the World Factbook I came up with more. And it's closer in size to Texas than it is to California. I always think of Madagascar as small. Me too. And full of lemurs. Yes. But I I figured I was probably wrong because Africa is huge. Mm -hmm. So next to it, it looks small. And then I wanted to see, like, actually, how big is it? And two and a half times the size of Great Britain is no slouch. It's, it's a large country with several different dinosaur localities. So this one's from the northwest, basically, of Madagascar. It's from the middle Jurassic about 168 to 165 million years ago, which is about what you would expect for this weird group of pterosaurs. And originally, it was assigned to Bothriospondylus madagascarensis, but that's no longer a valid dinosaur name. That's what Narindosaurus, at least what these bones were originally described as. Then for about 100 years, it was basically ignored in the literature. Very minimal references to the material were made. But in 2008, it was described as a basal eusauropod within true sauropods, which is where it still is. And then in 2016, it was more specifically classified in Turiosauria, which again, not a very commonly known group, but it includes ZB and Turiosaurus. You might know Turiosaurus if you're in Europe. Both of those are European from the Jurassic, but Turiosaurus is sometimes called the largest European dinosaur. It's about 30 meters or 100 feet long. It's got those front legs that are longer than the hind legs. So it's a little bit more of a upright stance usually depicted. That's what they tend to do when, you know, because otherwise, why would you sort of have that inclined angle to the back? Mm -hmm. But it's not nearly as upright as Brachiosaurus or Giraffe Titan or anything like that. It's still just like sort of a little bit upright. It has a really long tail, though. About half of its length, I would say, is tail. Wow. It's kind of an interesting dinosaur that I don't think has ever been our it's dinosaur like of the day. The inverse of Mementosaurus. Yeah, exactly. But I guess Diplodocus is like that, too. It's more tail than neck. Yeah. But it, Diplodocus might be a little more balanced than this one. Not all Turiosaurs are big, though. Moabasaurus, which is from the Cretaceous of North America, is also a Turiosaur. So they didn't just go extinct. It's, you know, the family tree of any group of animals is never that simple. So even though they're an outgroup that later evolved into true sauropods and neosauropods, this one maintained its lineage for about 40 or 50 million years into the Cretaceous and made it all over the world too, because we're talking about Madagascar, Europe, North America. They definitely got around. I say though, yes, normally groups don't just disappear except for around 66 million years ago, yeah. a bunch of them did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they do eventually disappear. Because again, we had, we have this one from the early Cretaceous of North America, but we don't have anything past that. So it might have disappeared then, or maybe we just haven't found the fossils yet. Really what I meant, though, is it's never as clean as like this new group rose and everything from the other group disappeared. Yeah, except for around mass extinction events. True. And in case you're wondering, Moabasaurus was more in the size range of Gariga Titan than it was like anything even remotely large. It was pretty small. At least what we think Gariga Titan's <laughs> size range was. The Gariga Titan individuals that aren't tentatively referred, the ones that are in the holotype. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, that 1906 find has gone by several names, but it's now called Narindosaurus tevanani. Narindosaurus is after the Narinda Bay where it was found. And Tevanani is after Armand Tevanon, who published the first description in 1907. It's a pretty fast turnaround, found in 1906, published in 1907. Yeah. The holotype includes tail vertebrae, ulna, tibia, fibula, and a pubis. So a decent find. But that's mostly what they said about Norindosaurus. And then they talked about all the other Turiosaurs? <laughs> yes, and Turiosaurs more generally. So... The real thing they were excited about for this paper was what they refer to as a Rosetta specimen of Lociosaurus. Well, that explains why it was the most mentioned dinosaur. <laughs> yes, exactly. So previously, they just had tail vertebrae, from the way I understand it. And they went back to the same site as the holotype and a paratype. And they found some skull pieces and a bunch of teeth and some more postcranial bones. As a result... 
they now have some pieces that kind of fill in gaps and connect different pteriosaurs that we previously couldn't really see how they were related, and thus the Rosetta specimen. Mm -hmm. The key find seems to be that pteriosaurs consistently have what they describe as heart-shaped teeth what? with grooves in the roots. Yeah, so heart-shaped teeth, it was hard for me to imagine. I was imagining them upside down. So I was thinking of heart-shaped teeth kind of like our molars where they have like bumps on the top, like the top of a heart, mm -hmm. but you have to flip it upside down. So it's a point on the side that sticks into the mouth and the heart, like the bottom, the, mm. the little bumps for the, on the heart right. are closer to the gum. It's like a drawing of a heart, not like a organ heart. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Heart shaped, like the shape of a heart, yeah. but the shape of a geometrical heart, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe a better way to describe it is that it looks a bit like a megalodon tooth. Those are also heart shaped. If you think about just shark oh, yeah. teeth in general, they sort of have a heart shape to them, but they're a little more bulbous. So on these or teeth, there's more of a bulb. I guess, by the gum line. Better for eating plants. Yeah, I suppose. They're just like less laterally compressed in general, except where they're wearing down because, you know, they rub against each other, which doesn't happen so much with shark teeth. And they're also less pointy and they're less serrated. I think they said some were pretty well preserved and didn't look like they were worn down and they still barely had any serrations. Hmm. Which isn't too surprising for a sauropod because we think they mostly just wanted to shovel food into their mouths and weren't so much with the chewing. Yep. There were also some of the teeth that were more typical spoon shapes. And then they were heterodonts with four different shapes. So they kind of ranged in that spectrum of heart shape to spoon shape <laughs> spectrum. Some were partially heart, partially spoon shaped in between. That's an interesting spectrum. Yes. I guess from... Having a shape to being more round. When I think spoon shaped, I just think round. Interesting. It's still, they're actually still pretty pointy. It's more like how a spoon is worn down on one side. Mm. So that, so it's kind of smooth on one side, more flat. And on the other side, more bulbous and oh, curved yeah. out. Yeah. But yeah, it's not quite as pointy on the top. So it is rounder sort of in profile. Phylogenetically speaking, because that was a main aim of this paper is to sort of nail down what pteriosaurs were, which ones were close relatives, and where they fit in the whole eusauropod tree. Losiosaurus came out as a sister taxa to pteriosaurus. And again, pteriosaurus is that one which may be the largest known European sauropod or dinosaur for that matter. Whereas Norindosaurus was more of a cousin, I would say. And it's actually in a more basal position. So they described it as the most primitive pteriosaur. So it's, it is quite important, Narindosaurus. Yeah. It's just too bad it didn't get its day in the, in the sun. There's, <laughs> there might be future papers about it. That's true. Interestingly, with their phylogeny, if you've followed pteriosaurs, obviously we haven't. But Amanzia and Narindosaurus showed up outside of pteriosauria in their analysis. And those are two that are had been classified within pteriosaurs. They refer to Losiosaurus as a giant specimen, which is fitting because its full name is Losiosaurus giganteus. Mm. But they didn't say much about the size of Norindosaurus, so I resorted to the supplemental material to try to find any bone that I could compare to another bone to get a rough approximation of at least if it was in the same ballpark of one of these other dinosaurs. Also, even in the supplemental material, Norindosaurus came after Losiosaurus. It was like number three versus number four of the supplemental material. Well, that's not what the paper was about. <laughs> the title even is Origin and Evolution of Pteriosaur Dinosaurs. Yeah, that's true. Set by a means of a new Rosetta specimen from Spain. That tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, very <laughs> true. It's all about Losiosaurus. So Norindosaurus had a fibula length of 74 centimeters or a little bit less than two and a half feet. And that's compared to 107 centimeters for an incomplete Losiosaurus. So it was actually longer if it was fully complete. And that's three and a half feet. So it's about 50% longer. Giant. Yes. Norindosaurus, its tibia diameter was about six centimeters. I should probably say width because it's not 
actually round. It's more flat on one side. So this is the minimum in the narrower dimension is about six centimeters or a little bit over two inches. But that might not even be the thinnest part because they didn't have a complete tibia. That's compared to 13 centimeters or over five inches for Lociosaurus. So it's well over twice as thick, which gives you a good idea that it was a much heavier dinosaur. So that might be another reason Narendosaurus didn't get as much air time here is because it definitely didn't have a claim at being the largest Turiosaur, just the most basal. It seems like the main result of their analysis is that, quote, Turiosauria is thus known from the middle Jurassic in Pangaea, diversified in the late Jurassic in Gondwana and Laurasia, and dispersed during the early Cretaceous to North America, end quote. So they accomplished what they set out to do. I don't know if they set out to do anything other than just live their lives, but they were pretty successful. Oh, I meant the authors of the paper accomplished <laughs> oh. what they set out to do, which is find out more about Turius. Oh, I'm always dinosaur focused. <laughs> yeah. Yes, very true. They found out more about dinosaur about Turiosaurus. <laughs> but sure, I'm sure the Turiosaurus just lived their lives. <laughs> they accomplished what they set out to do, too. Yeah. I'm sure at least some of them did. On other news, there was a lot of talk this last week about the four-year-old who found a dinosaur footprint in Wales. Did they find out what they set out to find? <laughs> well, she and her father were on a walk, so they probably found more than they were expecting to find. Ooh. Yeah. It was Lily Wilder and her father, Richard, and they were on a walk at Bendrick's Bay, that's in the Vale of Glamorgan. And if the Vale of Glamorgan sounds familiar, it's because we recently discussed it in our Dinosaur of the Day, Pantadraco, which was episode 321. So this footprint, it's 220 million years old. It's 10 centimeters long. It's probably from a quote-unquote slender animal that was bipedal and carnivorous. Sounds pretty dinosaur-y. Yeah. The fossil has been excavated, the footprint. It's now at the National Museum, Cardiff. Apparently, unfortunately, shortly after the find, some people have tried to remove rocks from the area and damage parts of the site where the footprint was found. Ugh. Stop it, people. And it's now a, I think it's a protected area because they found this footprint. Well, that's good. Hopefully people don't mess with it too much. Yeah. But at least that footprint was already taken away and stored somewhere safely. Yeah. It is hard to remove all of the <laughs> potentially useful footprints from an area, though. Mm-hmm. There's also been some debate and criticism around making Sushasaurus rex the official Washington state dinosaur. And no, Gary, it doesn't have anything to do with the actual dinosaur. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> of all the problems with it, they, they found something else? Well, the debate is it's taking away focus from COVID-19 related issues. Is there so much COVID-19 stuff for them to deal with that they don't have time for this? I think it's more an issue of... They have limited time or I'm a little fuzzy on the details, but maybe a limited number of legislation that they can put forth. And so that they want to prioritize, at least some people want to prioritize the COVID-19. But there's a, an argument and I think a good one that to push this forward is that you can show kids like the fourth grade students who first wrote in to name this state dinosaur that the government is for them and is listening. Yeah, I mean... I hate the idea of Sushasaurus rex being the official state dinosaur of Washington because it's not a dinosaur. But, <laughs> I mean, it's a dinosaur bone, but it's not a valid name for a dinosaur. So it's a bad idea, but not for this reason. <laughs> Although I don't think they should make Sushasaurus rex. <laughs> it could be a silver lining <laughs> if I, this dinosaur doesn't end up being the state maybe dinosaur. Maybe they'll come up with a different name. I mean, but they can't name it. It's just an unidentified theropod. Mm. Well, we'll see what happens. But I am always in favor of dinosaurs, and I know I'm biased. I mean, I like dinosaurs too, but you should name state dinosaurs after dinosaurs, not after made-up words. There are many dinosaurs that went by nicknames for many years, and then those nicknames became the official names. But this is like a theropod bone that they think washed up from Mexico. It's not, they're not going to find the rest of the skeleton in Washington and then give it a name. Maybe. I, stranger things have happened. Yeah. I'm not holding my breath. 
Sure, sure. <laughs> Same with dinosaurs. Lots of weird things happen all the time. Anyway, <laughs> move on to a less controversial topic. <laughs> We got some museum news. The Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History has a new exhibit, Dinosaurs, Land of Fire and Ice, which I think we've talked about this exhibit before because it was made by the Minnesota Children's Museum. Yes. So quick recap, Land of Fire, it's about T-Rex and Triceratops. Land of Ice has Trodon and Edmontosaurus. So it's like the Alberta is the land of ice in this? Alaska, I think is the thinking. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I guess they were up there too. Mm-hmm. So the exhibit is open until May 23rd. In Japan, and maybe outside of Japan, I'm a little unclear on the rules, but a, you can rent a full-size skeletal replica of the Mukawa Ryu dinosaur, also known as Kamuisaurus. But it was known as the Mukawa Ryu dinosaur for years before it was named Kamuisaurus. Yeah, it's just Kamuisaurus now, though. That's its real name. Anyway, <laughs> the replica is at Hobetsu Museum in Mukawa, Hokkaido, in Japan. And Mukawa Development of Industry and Nature Organization, a trading house, handles this rental service, which I think is technically free. It sounds like you pay only for delivery and installation fees. I'm not sure what the terms are. Like, I don't know how far away you can be <laughs> to rent this replica. Can we rent it? I kind of doubt it. The delivery fee would probably be expensive. Yeah, yeah, it would be. <laughs> and I don't know how long you can rent it for either. That's cool, though. Yeah, so one of the officials from the trading house said, quote, I want the dinosaur to help break through the stifling ambience deriving from the new coronavirus outbreak. So Bring the museum to you. Yeah. Dinosaurs are always a happy place. All right, Garrett, I got news about a state dinosaur that you won't find controversial. So, Massachusetts State Representative Jack Patrick Lewis revealed in a live stream in the last week that the state dinosaur of Massachusetts is Podocosaurus holiocensis. I can't remember if that was the one I was favoring or not. I didn't vote because I, I figured I don't live in Massachusetts, so I shouldn't vote. But they were both good options, I remember. So, which one is Podocosaurus? That's the one that Professor Talbot found in 1911, and she's the first woman to have named and described a dinosaur. It's a seal physoid. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that was the one I was going for, for that angle, as well as the fact that it wasn't the sauropod. Sauropodomorph, but yeah. Because I was just trolling a little bit. I see, I see. <laughs> anyway, the live stream it was pretty fun. It was about a half hour, and they had... Mark McMenamin from Mount Holyoke College and Fred Benny from Amherst College's Beneski Museum. And they each provided some background information on both dinosaurs, Patokosaurus and Ankysaurus. So I thought it was a nice way to let everybody know. I was lucky to have caught it. I just happened to have read the article that they were live streaming at the time that they were live streaming. <laughs> cool. But we have a link to the recording, right? Mm hmm. In the show notes. Yeah, that's cool. I like that they really engaged with all the Massachusettsians. <laughs> is that what it is? Oh, apparently it's Massachusetts. Like Wisconsinite. Yep. But they got them involved in the process, which is cool. Mm -hmm. And they picked a good dinosaur. They did. Well, they had two good options. Unlike Washington, which has zero good options. So just wait. <laughs> anyway, there's a new game moving on. Dinosaur Park Primeval Zoo. Guess what that's about, Garrett? I'm guessing it's a park builder game where you have dinosaurs. Yep. Simulation game. It's now out in the UK, rolling out in other places soon. It's described as you rehome your animals, but I'm not sure where you get them from in the first place. What do, you, what do you play this on? It's out on Android. Oh, okay. It's a mobile game. There aren't a, Maybe there are a lot of park builders. I always think of playing park builders on a computer, but... Oh, I think of it as mobile. Yeah, I guess I'm old. Oh, but... You're younger than me. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you profit from your park, which you use to fund your digs at expeditions, and then you get more dinosaurs, and it's set in the South Pole. There's a research station and your park. Set in the South Pole? Yeah. They set up this research station. I guess that's where you're rehoming your animals from, although I don't know why you're taking them from the wild. But anyway. I'm very confused. I think it's meant to be more cute than anything because it also looks too green and warm to be in the South Pole. 
Is this supposed to be in modern times or are we in the Mesozoic? We're in imagination land. Okay. Because sure. you're building a dinosaur park in modern times. <laughs> I guess anytime you have humans coexisting with dinosaurs, all bets are off. Yeah. But they're really cute. And the dinosaurs, when you get them, they come out of ice because <laughs> you're in the South Pole. And they have these playgrounds to play on. I have so many questions. Well, you'll have to play and then maybe that'll answer them. <laughs> in Jurassic Park media news somebody reimagined the trailer and then they replaced all the dinosaurs with Pee Wee herman why it's pretty funny <laughs> it's made by pixel right and it's a, it's a lot of Pee Wee laughing maniacally and then popping up from hiding places being called a clever girl <laughs> oh i see and then they have the scene where the jeep is driving away and it's Pee Wee chasing up on a bicycle uh, that's pretty clever yeah it's pretty entertaining so you've got a link to that so other people can watch. Is it okay to talk about the spoilers for Camp Cretaceous or should we push that another week? I guess it's okay because this will come out after we've watched the last season. Okay. I'm just going to cover my ears because I don't want the spoilers. <laughs> okay. So recap, we're only halfway through Garrett and I season two so far and Garrett is literally covering his ears and trying to be far away. I can still hear Anyway, there's a hint at a new dinosaur in an underground cryotube that's thawing out. And it could show up in future Camp Cretaceous seasons. It's called Specimen E750. I don't know what the E stands for. Maybe there's something in the show I've missed or haven't seen yet. According to Screen Rant, it screeches like a velociraptor and it has either a spiny tail or jagged teeth. And that's based on this image where it's behind opaque glass. Maybe ice. I guess we'll find out when we watch. So there's speculation it's either Spinoraptor or a Gigantosaurus. And Colin Trevorrow has said that Camp Cretaceous will eventually connect to Jurassic World Dominion. And now I've said it all, so Garrett, it's safe to come back. Gave him the thumbs up. Oh, okay, good. I heard something about a raptor, and that was about it. So my, my ear covering was pretty successful. D dinosaur, dinosaur, dinosaur. That's the gist. <laughs> good. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Velifrons, which was a request from Brad the Curator via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Velifrons was a Lambiosaurine hadrosaurid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Coahuila, Mexico, in the Cerro del Pueblo formation. It was bulky, it probably walked on all fours, it kind of looks like Parasaurolophus, but more like Carithosaurus. Oh, it's got a big crest on its head? Yes. Because instead of having the long tube on its head like Parasaurolophus, it had this fan-shaped crest. Velifrons was herbivorous. Only a juvenile has been found so far, and that one's estimated to be 25 feet or 7.6 meters long. So it's possible it could grow to 30 to 35 feet as an adult, or 9 to 10.6 meters. That's pretty big. That's on the near the upper end as far as hadrosaurs got. Mm -hmm. I think 40 feet is about where they maxed out from my recollection. So Bigger than some of the sauropods you were telling us about. Yeah, bigger than a lot of them. <laughs> At least longer. <laughs> the dentary, the lower jaw, was long and slender and slightly downturned. And like I mentioned, it had this bony crest on its forehead. The crest probably would have changed as it grew. Because again, they found a juvenile, or they think it's a juvenile. Lambiosaurine skulls and crests change a lot as they grow. So the crest... Probably wasn't done developing. Yeah, they think they're pretty much display structures. Mm -hmm. The nose of Velifrons was on the top of its skull, and then the snout extended backward up its face to fill in the gap. What? Yeah, it had this series of passages where air flowed through from the snout into the crest and into this hold above its eyes. Oh, I see. So the, the snout extending backward is like the nasal passages. Yeah. Extending backwards. Interesting. It's sort of like Parasaurolophus, where they think the nasal passages might have been connected to the big tube on its head, mm -hmm. and it could breathe through them and make noises. Yeah, so like Parasaurolophus, Velifrons' complex nasal passages could probably make sounds. It also seems to have more rapid growth of its nasal than other similarly sized dinosaurs. That's interesting. I hadn't heard of other dinosaurs than Parasaurolophus making sounds, especially in like a round crest. Maybe since I played trombone, the trombone shape was more obvious to me than the, the round shape. But I guess that's kind of like a French horn or something. Yeah. So like most juvenile hadrosaurs, it had this proportionately large skull. But for its development stage as this juvenile or subadult, the skull is still pretty large. 
And it's not clear what the fan-shaped crest was for. It could have been to attract mates. Not necessarily sound. The type and only species is Velifrons coahuilensis. The genus name means sailed forehead, and it refers to the sail-like crest on its head, which has also been described as hatchet-like and fan-shaped. The species name is in honor of the state of Coahuila, where the dinosaur was found. Velifrons was named in 2007 by Terry Gates and others, and the fossils were first found by Martha Carolina Aguillon. It was excavated between 1992 and 2001 by field crews from the Dynamation International Society, so many, many volunteers. And then in 2002, a joint expedition with Utah Museum of Natural History, Royal Tiro, and Museo del Desierto worked to excavate the skull bones, and they found a partial juvenile skeleton and a mostly complete skull. The skull and skeleton were disarticulated. It took them two weeks to dig out the skull out of 12 feet of rock and soil. Oof. Yeah. And then it took two years to prepare the skull, and it was prepared by Jerry Golden, a volunteer at the Utah Museum of Natural History. So Velifrons is very similar to juvenile Carithosaurus and Hippocrisaurus. And even though it was a juvenile, it was found to be distinct enough to be its own genus. In 1981, William Morris described question mark Lambiosaurus laticatus, and the question mark is in the front there because it was not definitive since no complete crest was found. That was something I had to look up. I didn't realize we sometimes wrote that. Yeah, throw a question mark before the dinosaur name. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> and this description was based on a partial skull found in Baja, California in the El Gallo Formation. And then Gates and others found that Velifrons was still too different from this non-definitive Lambiosaurus laticatus, which is actually now known as Magnapolia as of 2012. So Velifrons is one of the first dinosaurs named from Mexico, and when it was named, it was the first new North American Lambiosauri named in over 70 years. At the time that Velifrons lived, there was a warm, shallow sea from the Arctic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico, and Velifrons lived on Laramidia at the southern tip, you know, what is now Mexico. It lived in a humid estuary where rivers meet the sea, and a lot of fossilized snails and marine clams were found in the area, so it probably lived near the shore. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included large tyrannosaurs, troodontids, ornithomimids, and ceratopsids. There were a lot of large storms, which seems to have led to many maths deaths. There's large bone beds of jumbled hadrosaur and ceratopsian skeletons found in the area. That's a bummer for them, but nice for us. Yeah. <laughs> And there's a sculpture form of Velifrons as Ikiro the Dino. It's a 30-foot skeleton built for Burning Man by Marianela Fuentes. And after Burning Man, it went to Washington, D.C. and was on an 11th floor roof deck for a while. Nice. I like a good dinosaur at Burning Man. Yeah, we talked about it when it was in D.C. It had, there's these colorful bones that were inspired by the designs of the Huichol tribe in Mexico. So we did talk about it. Up until that point, but I just found out that last February it had moved on, Akira the Dino, to the Children's Discovery Museum in San Jose. And that's San Jose, California. Cool. We should go check it out. I don't think it's still there. Oh. But as I'm saying it, it sounds vaguely familiar. Like maybe we did hear about it in February. I can't remember. We missed out. We should have gone. Mm. But the original Velifrons specimens permanently housed at the Museo del Desierto in Saltillo, Coahuila, Mexico. Nice. And our fun fact of the day is inspired by Valentine's Day, because Valentine's Day is coming up. So I got you a triple dinosaur fact. Oh, is that my present? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a handmade present. It's more thoughtful than if I just bought you something. Mm. <laughs> So the first piece of it, you might remember from SVP 2020, there was a talk by Emmy Bender, and she was talking about ceratopsian frills being ornaments and not weapons. There was sort of a dichotomy between, was it a functional weapon or defense sort of mechanism, or was it just an ornament that you grow for display and it doesn't really serve a lot of other purpose? Because frills on ceratopsians vary a lot in between different species, that shows that it was probably a display structure although it might have had some functional value because there are horn scrape marks on them, so it might have been a little bit useful as a defensive structure. So maybe I shouldn't say that there's this 
dichotomy of weapons versus display structures because they could always be a little bit of both. Horns, for the record, are considered weapons and not ornaments by her analysis. So the horns were weapons, at least the the post-orbital eye horns, whereas the frill was considered an ornament. And another piece of evidence that it might have been an ornament and not a weapon is that they tended to have really large frills or very decorated frills, which seems to show that they were display structures, big showy things, often display structures. And a lot of them had either large frills or decorated frills, not necessarily both at the same time. Seem like different ways to show off. Hmm. You also probably remember, since we've been watching Dinosaurs, there was an episode with Charlene, the daughter on the show, and she was growing her display structure, since I guess she's going through dinosaur puberty. And she's some kind of ceratopsian. She's got a small protoceratops-esque frill, Mm -hmm. I would say. Although it does have some epiosifications decorating the edge of it, which protoceratops didn't have. I think they also gave her earrings. Yes, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> maybe i'm nitpicking if she's wearing earrings mm-hmm. and also different outfits of clothing all the time and walking bipedally yes this is very true <laughs> although protoceratops might have been bipedal mm. you know not uh, the way charlene's walking that's true she's like <laughs> vertical because <laughs> there's a human inside the suit mm-hmm. this is true but her display structure in the show is her tail and specifically like how she moves it mm-hmm. it's supposed to be like how they do their mating display type stuff It seems like they picked a feature that all dinosaurs share for the story purposes because it's all sorts of different dinosaur species living together in the same house, which I guess is a whole other story of how did a megalosaurus and something that looks kind of like a dimetrodon have a protoceratops. I think Fran is supposed to be a Dilophosaurus. Oh, is that? Yeah. Except she's got like four frills. So she's like a Quadlophosaurus. Yeah. It did make me think, though, that maybe Diplodocids could have used their tail as a display structure Mm. because they were long and they have like the ability to kind of whoosh around like they show in walking with dinosaurs. I can see that being a thing or maybe some communication method signaling device, especially if there was some coloration on it. Like if it had a bright tip or something, you could draw (laughs) some attention, I think. But according to a new paper by Andy Knopp and others about protoceratops, their frills were probably the display structure and not the tail like Charlene in Dinosaurs. The paper had a pretty funny opening. It said, quote, sexual selection arising from competition for fertilization opportunities, Mm. (laughs) which I think is hilarious and also applies to Valentine's Day. I suppose. The competition for fertilization opportunities. (laughs) (laughs) So romantic. I thought so. So this paper had three key findings. It was that the frill changed independent of other skull regions. So it, it wasn't just like a typical, it's growing up and so it's slowly getting bigger. It changed independently of that. It also had a lot of variability, the frill did, more than other parts of the skull, which indicates it might be a display structure. And finally, the frill grew much faster than other parts of the skull. Hmm. So you could imagine if you reach a certain age and all of a sudden having display structures is important. You would, you'd want to grow it rapidly. And yeah. that's basically what they see with protoceratops. Like how Charlene grew her tail rapidly. Exactly. Yeah, it was like overnight on the show. Yeah. All of a sudden the vertebrae just exploded out, I guess. But it works in this protoceratops case because they had lots of protoceratops ages to work with. It's a pretty well-known dinosaur genus. So it's relatively easy to do studies like this. They looked, but they couldn't find any sexual dimorphism. They were kind of hoping at the outset they might be able to find a group that had a bigger frill or a different shape or something, but they couldn't find anything. And to that effect, they point out that animals often don't have major differences when they mutually select. We've talked a little bit about this before, but for example, there are less differences with monogamous species of birds than there are with birds where one just does a display, they mate, and then takes off. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the monogamous ones are both trying to impress the other one because they're trying to stick together for a long time. That makes sense. But I, I don't know enough about birds skeletally to know these ones that where the males, for example, have to do the elaborate dances with all of the feathers and everything. How different skeletally do they look from the females? Yeah, it's a good point because if it's just feathers, you're not going to see it on the skeleton. But in some birds, the males are bigger. Mm -hmm. So in the case of like protoceratops, if it was bigger, just in general, you might be able to see some kind of signal there. 
Although it can always, if it's just size alone, that can just get lost in the individual variation. So yeah, to your point, you'd want to see the actual structure of the display structure be bigger in one or the other. And if it was just a coloration pattern or something, we're not going to see that in these fossils, unfortunately. So the result is the frill was for socio-sexual display, but the socio part of that is really important. That's like societal, same root word. So it gives information about, say, the age and the species of protoceratops, not just a big display structure for courtship. So it's a display structure, but display structures can be for social signaling in addition to just sexual display. Happy Valentine's Day. Yeah. Happy Valentine's Day to you. <laughs> and on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us and your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.